right, and welcome. Just getting a sec uh, to share my screen. Hopefully it, it's working for everybody out there. So my name is Marty Kierman. Um, I'm the partner in charge <clears throat> of the Tax Credits Incentives Advisory Group at Cherry Becker. Um, thank you all for attending today. This is our monthly ERC update. Um, we've been doing these throughout the year and we'll continue to due to a variety of reasons. One, there are some new updates uh, since we last had this uh, from the IRS. Um, additionally, we'll cover some of the rules basically as well, um, but it still seems like due to so much marketing and information and potentially misinformation out there regarding the employee retention credit um, that we tend to get the highest amount of uh, uh, subscribers to this kind of, to this kind of uh, podcast when it's on this topic. So with that said, um, yeah, I'm Marty Kerman. I'm based out of um, our DC-ish office out of Tyson's Corner. I spent some time in New York City as well, kind of live between both places. Um, uh, today, okay, so going forward in the future, in um, September, we're going to have uh, another ERC, okay, I'm, I'm avoiding scams, things like that. Um, but with that said, um, there, there's going to be one in September, October, November, and probably December too on ERC. There tends to be always some kind of update that we have. So we're going to cover some of the IRS updates. And I'll get into some of the um, information um, from an update standpoint first, and then maybe some topics about interest. And then we'll get back to some of the basics of the ERC and how it works. But um, I think right now, probably everybody has some familiarity with the employer retention credit due to all the marketing and everything that we see uh, on the radio, on podcasts. Uh, I've even seen like Ty Burrell from Modern Family um, doing it. It's, and uh, I think I've seen it on Shark Tank too, somebody starting in the ERC business. So um, happy to provide the information to you because we've done roughly over, uh, you know, worked with, the, we've probably scoped out like 1600 clients, but really done um, ERC work for just a little over a thousand of them right now. And the reason for that is because we do a lot of upfront analysis. Not everyone qualifies and we're clear about that. So we just really want to make sure um, that we are uh, adequately scoping everybody. But we'll, we'll talk to anybody on a complimentary basis to make sure that they can um, they can qualify. All right. So polling question one, um, how did you hear about this? I think we asked this every time in the webinar about this webinar. Uh, a Cherry Becker tax advisor, uh, an email from Cherry Becker, a friend or colleague, Cherry Becker alum, or a social media post. And we'll give a minute for everybody to uh, take the time to provide their uh, response here. Want to give everybody time as well so they can get their CPE credit. So we don't want to shut this thing down too early. But we'll wait a moment and let that go. All right, we about ready to close that one down yet? Okay, so email from Cherry Becker. So uh, kudos to uh, our marketing team and thank you for responding to the email and the social media posts as well. That's great. Um, so that's how it is. Okay, great. So let's move on to the next slide. Okay, so we're gonna talk a bit about um, some updates that have come out from the IRS, some I think that are much more important than others. Um, the first one's gonna be uh, about the supply chain guidance. And um, what we're talking about there is uh, when you can potentially apply for the employer retention credit, you as a employer need to identify one of two things, either a de significant decline in your gross receipts in 20, or 21 as compared to the exact same calendar quarter in 19. But then alternatively, you have the opportunity to show that you might have been directly um, disadvantaged or disrupted or partially shut down due to a government order um, specific to COVID, uh, limiting what's known as commerce travel or group meetings. Early on in both the FAQs and the original notice uh, in 2021, the IRS came up with a caveat for what's known as essential businesses, those that really aren't uh, touched by the government orders directly, to the extent they had a supplier 
who um, had experienced a partial shutdown due to government orders on them. And then sort of by a transference property, uh, the company itself uh, had a partial shutdown as a result of not being able to get the supplies and the supply chain uh, and the supply chain disruption. That then is treated as a partial disruption on the company there. I'm sure you've heard about this. This is the area that is both, I think, a very good opportunity for companies to identify that they may um, qualify for the employee retention credit. But additionally, it is the one area that I think is most rampant with fraud. And we'll talk about why. Um, and we'll go through these others in a moment as, as, we, uh, as we get into the slides. All right, so from a supply chain disruption perspective, um, last month, the IRS issued what's known as a general legal advice memo um, talking about what was required or really what it gave was five examples of um, supply chain disruptions that they've seen taxpayers try to use for purposes of qualifying for the employee retention credit. Um, as it turned out, like in all five examples, it's a non-qualifying um, situation. Essentially what they're doing is trying to, but what they're making the case with this is that in order to identify that you have a supply chain disruption for purposes of qualification for the employer retention credit, one, you need to identify the supplier itself and the location of that supplier. You need to identify the government order on that supplier. And, and then your qualification period really only lasts as long as the duration of that government order. Where we see a lot of this is that uh, you see a lot of flow of goods uh, coming from outside the US. This is probably where we see the most supply chain disruptions. And we've seen some foreign mandates be used. And I think um, we think that's acceptable to identify the foreign mandates as having a disruptive effect on the supplier. But we see quite a bit in Mexico. We see quite a bit coming from Asia, specifically China. Um, and then some other areas as well. We actually have an article published on this on our website if you're interested in taking a look at it, both on supply chains in general, specific to uh, the employer retention credit. And then most recently, we did an article mentioning and going through the examples um, of why a company might not qualify. With that said, what's most important, as we can see from this new guidance, is, uh, and this, is that, again, you need to show the, uh, the government mandate on the supplier, indicate that that government order caused a partial suspension of the supplier. supplier. Um, you have to show that also uh, the, the company itself that's receiving the supplies was not able to uh, basically find another avenue of supply chain for them. Um, yeah, they need, to they need to show the inability to obtain the goods um, from somewhere else and there, therefore that having a partial suspension. Some of the bad facts in there were companies that just cited general newspaper articles that there was an overall supply chain disruption and sort of like everybody knew that there was a supply chain disruption out there and so therefore I qualify. And this is where I've seen companies fall into, uh, I would say the prey of some um, providers that just sort of give a general view of like, say, hey, supply chain disruptions can qualify. And then they have the company attest that they had supply chain disruptions and then they'll do the credit calculation, um, but they don't really document well. So I think it's a great area of opportunity to claim the employee retention credit, but really what we're always looking for is additional data uh, beyond who the supplier was, beyond how long they were uh, partially shut down due to government orders. We wanna show that effect on the company and that generally comes in like showing how many supplies they were able to purchase in 20, let's say 2021 compared to 2019, what the lead time delays were on the able to on, on their ability to provide final goods due to these supply chain disruptions. Um, and so I just would say anyone who may be attending, uh, please feel free to reach out to me or someone on my team and we can talk through your fact pattern. Um, we've done a, a, ho a whole host of them and so we're very familiar with it. So I'll leave it at that, but it really was an interesting note because I think some companies, as I heard during uh, a Ways and Means Committee testimony, really that uh, recently, that um, 
some companies that wanted to claim these supply chain disruptions after this came out, they suddenly decided, oh my gosh, no, I don't, uh, because the IRS has basically addressed my fact pattern. Um, and so, again, we can look between the good fact patterns and the bad fact patterns and help provide a good documentation trail for purposes of identifying supply chain disruptions that would help you qualify, but uh, also, most importantly, let you know that you don't qualify if you don't. I think that's that's as important of our job as anything else. Um, final regs came out as well, just addressing the recapture of erroneous claimed ERCs and other COVID-19 credits. This was also in July since we had our last one. Um, basically treating them as an underpayment of taxes that had to be assessed and collected. The one thing as well um, that I noted during some of this Ways and Means Committee testimony recently is um, there is somewhat of a lack of guidance out here, and especially for practitioners. Um, let's say, for example, someone files an ERC and the CPA becomes aware of it, uh, and it, it maybe they did a, an inadvertent calculation, didn't quite know uh, how to like look at the accounting between PPP and ERC or something minor. There's not a lot of guidance out there in terms of like how to cure that and give it back. Um, if there is some to give back, um, maybe give back the whole thing or give back just a, por a portion of it, especially when there's just like a slight difference between what the ERC should be and what was already received. Um, there's a lack of guidance there. So we're kind of waiting for something on that as well. Um, but I'll, I'll leave that there. But uh, yeah, so we now at least have some additional guidance on recapture of a role as you claim ERCs. The other thing I just want to mention here that many people forget is when you file for an employee retention credit, uh, you as the employer, the taxpayer, you have to basically take it into income, but not when you get the money. You do it basically in the past. If you claimed a 2020 ERC or a 2021 ERC, you need to reduce your wages by the amount of the credit that you claim or receive. Uh, and so essentially that's an increase in taxable income in 20 or 21 which may require an amended return to be filed. Um, and so sometimes when it's a small ERC um, to be received, say three to four employees, some of the hassle of amending those returns from the prior years um, and the fees associated with that, along with potential the fees they may pay to a provider uh, to do the work for them around the ERC, it makes it not necessarily all that beneficial. Um, but just keep in mind that you have to basically include these ERCs in income in the past in 20 or 21, depending on uh, which year to which the, the ERC relates. Uh, this is what I was talking about, the House Ways and Means Committee hearing. This was on July 27th as well. I was having in July uh, around the employee retention credit. Um, it was an interesting group of individuals. There was one gentleman who was uh, a representative from a professional employment organization, a PEO, Basically, PEOs file on behalf of their clients. They have one giant 941 in which they file a 941X. Um, and uh, they had some issues and complaints regarding the fact that uh, their claims had been quite slow to be uh, addressed. And I, I've, I've worked with some taxpayers who are working with a number of PEOs where they feel as if it's just been lost and it hasn't. It's just that the IRS needs to look at all the different, uh, basically employers that the PEO represents um, on one sort of batch filing. And so it takes a long time when you're working with a PEO. And unfortunately for uh, myself and other tax uh, providers in my firm, we are not able to get a power of attorney and check on behalf of the taxpayer because it really is just between the PEO and the IRS. Um, two other practitioners um, noted that some of the issues around ERC specifically were due to the backlog that was there, um, that, that is there currently with the IRS. I, I would say an, esti an estimate right now is that we're somewhere between four to 500,000 of unprocessed ERC claims right now. The backlog has gone down significantly, but I still think they're like processing like 40,000 a week. And uh, a number of new ones still keep coming in due to both the viability of, of the program, but also just the heavy advertising from what's known as ERC mills. These are these companies, you'll generally see them with the, with the word, <clears throat> the letters ERC in their name, 
Um, and the IRS has issued some warnings to watch, what to watch out for with some of these mills, which I'll talk about in a moment. There was also another woman um, at the Ways and Means Committee hearing. And by the way, it's available on YouTube, I saw. You can find it pretty easily um, if you want to take the time to, to look at it. But um, she worked uh, for a conglomeration of nonprofit organizations out of New Jersey. And one thing she wanted to make clear is everybody that the ERC does apply to nonprofits as well. Um, but again, what was noted as the slowdown, and I think is true, is that there's no ability for the most part to do an electronic filing of a 941X. They're all paper filings. And as a result, that has slowed the service down significantly um, in terms of processing these employer retention credit backlogs. Um, and, and, you know, the hope, I believe they said, is that by next year, there may be an ability to start to do electronic filings. That won't take, take, uh, take care of anybody who's already filed and is waiting, but potentially for the final year, I would say between April of 2024 and April of 2025, um, there may be some ability to do some electronic filing. Keep in mind that the employee retention credits for 2020 have a statutory deadline to be filed by April 15th, 2024, and the ERCs, the three of them in 2021, need to be filed no later than April 15th, 2025. So there's still a decent amount of time associated with this program. Um, and so it's worthy of investigation. But I would also say this, to the extent you have investigated and you feel confident, don't feel like you're missing something because you're getting all these robocalls from companies, these ERC mills out there telling that you may qualify for $26,000 per employee. Um, you may, but also they're just blanketing these calls toward everyone. It was also during the Ways and Means Committee hearing that like some of the members actually played the um, played the recordings of some of the robocalls that they've gotten, and they didn't even own businesses. They're just calling everybody <clears throat> out there. So feel free to talk to your CPA, uh, your your tax um, your tax provider, but our best recommendation is um, work with a work with a true CPA firm who can understand whether you qualify or not, and work with someone who will actually sign the amended form nine forty one X, not not a provider that doesn't sign it and then requires you to go find somebody else to help file it after they've done their analysis. Um, this is what I've been talking about. <clears throat> House Ways and Means Committee. The other thing as well, uh, Office of Professional Responsibility back in March of 2023 came out with some guidance for tax professionals such that um, it's almost a warning essentially because as I mentioned, when you claim an ERC uh, and you file this amended form 941X payroll tax, you have to take it into income by virtue of doing a reduction of deductions in either 20 or 21. And if, say, for example, the CPA didn't have anything to do with the ERC study, and they have to then go back and amend these returns on behalf of their client, um, they need to be comfortable that the there is a valid employee retention credit claim. Um, essentially, if they don't make that analysis, they're treated as almost perpetuating what may be a, an improper credit or, or a fraudulent claim. So you may find that your tax preparer may not want to reduce your deductions due to you working with some ERC mill or somebody else, best to get whoever you did the ERC with and your CPA in contact and have that discussion. But it can get a little, um, I don't know, difficult at times when you are have filed an ERC, you've been told you qualify, and then your CPA says maybe you don't and they won't, they won't amend your returns. So it just, it's a lot of um, disconnect there at times and friction that shouldn't have to happen. But I would just say, again, your CPAs will be on notice to be, to be sure that these ERC claims are um, accurately calculated and that you actually qualify as what's known as an eligible employer. Um, I would just say, be aware of aggressive pitches from scammers who promote large ERC refunds. Uh, we've seen this quite a bit. Um, and, and the IRS every year lists its dirty dozen most uh, potentially abused uh, tax positions. And this year, not surprising, employer retention credit is number one. Again, that is not to say that it's not a great program that provides wonderful benefits to companies, but it is 
something that, again, there's so much, uh, a, I guess, so much advertising out there um, and so many companies with the name ERC in their name who may not be around in like a year or two um, that they're trying to like basically con at times ineligible companies into claiming the credit. Um, you'll see some ads based on inaccurate info, um, but let, let's move on. But just keep in mind that ERC is on the IRS's minds. I have not seen many examinations of the employee retention credit, but I have seen some. Uh, and it's a standard information document request that I've seen so far. And we'll go through what they're asking for toward the end of this so you can get a sense of what's necessary. Um, again, common warning signs, charging a fee based on the size of the refund. That's sort of like the contingent fee um, analysis. The issue there is what I've seen is there's sort of a um, an impetus to try to, as, as an ERC mill would, try to increase the amount of credit as high as possible so they can get their fee as large as possible. Taxpayer then gets a refund less the fee they paid. And then later, if they find out that they didn't qualify or get examined by the IRS, they don't have the money anymore because they paid a lot of it to their provider. Um, so just again, work with someone who will sign your 941X. Uh, not to say contingent fees are necessarily bad uh, because a lot of companies don't have the money to come up with something in, immediately. But those that don't charge contingent fees are generally our CPA firms who generally can't uh, do contingent fees for federal credit work. And so I just like that. And I like that arrangement better because the provider is really not incented to get the credit claim as high as possible because they're not taking it. They're not taking a, a piece of the credit. They're really charging for a service based on generally a flat fee that they'll scope out for you earlier. Um, yeah, keep uh, keep away from like unsolicited calls and advertisements from uh, ERC mills. Um, a lot of watch out for large upfront fees to claim fees to claim the credit. Um, yeah, let's see what else here. I guess promoters. Yeah, telling ah, this is a big one. Promoters telling businesses to ignore the advice of their trusted tax professional. But more importantly, <laughs> I have seen some companies indicate that uh, both that the IRS guidance is not controlling. Uh, and so we generally follow IRS guidance. It's the best way to go. Um, it's interesting. They'll say the IRS guidance isn't controlling, but then they'll say they'll make a claim based on a supply chain uh, disruption, which is only found in IRS guidance, not actually in the statute. So they, they try to have it a little bit both ways. But anybody who tells you that um, your ERC uh, is not the IRS isn't going to adhere, adhere to its own guidance or doesn't have the authority to do so when they look at this. I wouldn't work with them. Work with somebody who's following the IRS guidance. Specifically, uh, I think it's notice 2021-20, which was the first major piece of guidance uh, that came out back in 2021. All right. Okay, polling question two. Was your business impacted by government shutdown uh, mandates in relation to COVID-19? Again, these are the government orders limiting commerce, travel, or group meetings generally issued by a state or local authority. Um, again, in our opinion, we can look at foreign mandates as well, which we've seen some apply to some foreign port closures and also some uh, manufacturers in, in Mexico as well. Um, but let's uh, let's see what the let's see what happens here. And oh, there's also the concept of an essential business as well. So those essential businesses that change date, depending on which jurisdiction they're in, they um, they may not even be touched by government orders. All right, okay, your business was impacted by COVID nineteen orders. Great. So um, again, we're going to talk about these rules now. But if not, if your customer base was, there may still be an opportunity to qualify due to some decline in your gross receipts um, be, due to, it's assumed to be due to government orders on your uh, on your customers. All right. All right, so let's get a little bit back to basics <clears throat> for everyone. Uh, there are four employee retention credits. There is one for uh, 
the time period of March 13th, 2020 through the end of 2020, December 31st, there are then three more um, for each of the first, and they correspond exactly to the first three, each of the first three quarters of 2021. Um, the 2020 credit is a smaller credit <clears throat> over a longer period of time. So the maximum credit you can get for 2020 is 5,000 per employee. Basically it's 50% of the amount paid <clears throat> in qualified wages by the company. And that includes both, we'll call it gross wages and healthcare costs as well, up to 10,000 multiplied by 50,000. So if you have a lot of part-timers that um, don't make, we'll say 10,000 over the period of whatever qualification you have, you'll get something less than that, but you get 50% of the amount you pay them. In 2021, the credit went up to 70% of the qualified wages. So 70% times 10,000 per quarter for each of the first three quarters, um, you can get as high as 7,000 per employee. So this is what you see is the max you can get in 2020 is 5,000 per employee. And the max you can get in 2021 is 21,000 per employee. That's when you hear uh, all these advertisements like you can get up to $26,000 per employee. That's where that comes from. But again, that's over the course of four credits, each of which you have to separately qualify for um, under distinctly, sometimes similar, sometimes different qualification criteria. All right, <clears throat> so here's, here's how you qualify in 2020. One is known, one test is known as what we call the government mandate test. Essentially, um, if you are an employer that is partially, experience a partial suspension, of your operations due to COVID-19 orders, limiting, say, for example, how many could people could be in a room together, or how many, um, well, basically having to work from home, or something like that, uh, inability to travel, although the travel restrictions are much lighter than people think they were. Um, to the extent your business suffered a disruption due to these COVID-19 orders, that's known as a government mandate test. There's also the gross receipts test. And it's harder to qualify for the gross receipts test in 2020 than it is in 21, because under the gross receipts test, the employer needs to show a more than 50% decline in its gross receipts in either quarter one, two, three, or four of 2020 compared to one, two, three, or four of 2019. We're always comparing back to 2019, the pre-COVID year, as sort of our base year for making our analysis. I found initially, <clears throat> well, initially when this when this came out, uh, those that claimed that received a PPP fund were not even eligible to look at the employer retention credit. Later, on December 27, 2020, they changed that rule, which allowed companies to start to look back. But point being, I see more claims under the government mandate test in 2020 due to the fact that the showing of a more than 50% decline in gross receipts is actually quite an onerous amount to show. Um, so if, we'll leave it at that, but um, but uh, I, would say, I would say in 2020, more companies file under the government mandate test. And then in 2021, the rules were made, again, the credits were increased from 50% of the first 10,000 to 70% of the first 10,000, but the gross receipts test was made easier to qualify for, essentially, um, an employer only had to show a more than 20% decline in gross receipts. And say, for example, in quarter one of 2021, you had only a 19% decline in your gross receipts. That wouldn't get you to qualification as compared to quarter one of 2019. But you have this good little rule that's taxpayer friendly that allows companies to look at the current or the prior quarter uh, for the 2021 test. So those companies can also look at quarter four of 2020 compared to quarter four of 19, if there was, let's say, for example, a 21% decline there, that can be a proxy stand-in for the um, quarter one, 2021. And so that rule applies through those quarters. You can use the current or the prior quarters analysis to look for a more than 20% decline. What I used to say was that I think more companies were filing under the gross receipts test in 2021 for two reasons. One, the mandates started to drop off in, um, in 2021, they weren't as strong as they were in 2020, but also, um, yeah, having a more than 20% decline is, is much easier to find than a more than 50% decline. But lately, what I have seen is that due to this 
analysis of the supply chain disruption, some companies lately have been, I've seen more government order tests than I have gross receipts tests lately. And it's interesting. What I'll see is that companies will come to me and they'll say, hey, the rules changed. Now I know it have to just have the gross receipts. I don't think the rules ever really change that much. It's just that this um, employee retention credit specific to government orders on your suppliers has become much more publicized and much more abused. Not to say that I don't have a lot of clients who are using that and, and I think legitimately and have received money as well due to the supply chain disruptions they faced. But um, again, I used to think the grocery seats was much more common in 21. Lately, I, and I, I would imagine for the next year, probably all those companies that had a more than 20% decline in grocery seats have identified it and claimed for it already. And so now the ERC emails are really pushing to find uh, qualification for companies that haven't claimed yet and they're looking at the supply chain thing pretty hard. Okay. Partial suspension definition. What you will also hear is that you have to have a, these government orders have to have a disruption on a more than nominal portion of your business. Really what that means is it can't be just like some supply chain disruption or, or a mandate on something that just affects a very, very small piece of your business. Something that you could rate as like less than 10% of the hours that you spent of your time or less than 10% of uh, the revenues brought in, like measured back in 2019, it actually has to be having an effect on a, a more than <clears throat> nominal piece of your business. And so we're always focused on identifying how the order affects the company. And we wanna show how the company operated without that government order in place back in 2019 and show that comparison. So that's what we're looking at when we talk about having a more than nominal and impact on a more than nominal portion of the business. Okay, so the gross receipts test. Um, generally speaking, it is more than just your sales revenues. It's total sales um, plus dividends, interest, rents, royalties, other income. Um, and then it, to the, on the other income side from the sale of assets, shall we say, the amount of gross receipts is reduced by the adjusted basis of the property basically what you paid for that property. Um, in the not-for-profit tax-exempt context, the only difference is that um, the sale of assets, you don't subtract out the basis, it's the entire growth proceeds. So what I have seen in the nonprofit context in 2019 is that there may have been some sale of some asset and un, you know, unbeknownst, un, unrelated to COVID, what have you, they just had a very high spike in gross receipts in 2019 compared to 21. Um, and so we found qualification there, especially in this tax exempt entity uh, perspective around these gross receipts. Um, again, if you're a cash basis taxpayer, you need to use your cash basis gross receipts. If you're an accrual basis taxpayer, you need to your, use accrual basis gross receipts. It follows how you file for tax. So we'll leave it at that. Okay. Qualified wages. What this really means here is that there is a difference in how the credit is allocated to either large or small taxpayers. So for these, if this is really intended to be to benefit small employers. And so for the 2020 credit, for those employers that had on average 100 or fewer full-timers working for them in 2019, they're treated as a small employer. And as a small employer, um, if you are qualifying during the period of qualification, you as the employer can include in the calculation the wages paid to everybody at the company, basically anyone who's a, who's a W-2 employee. Now, let's say, for example, though, you had 101 on average full-time employers in 2019. Um, you can then only include in the calculation, even if you qualify, wages paid to employees, what's known as not providing services. But think of it as wages paid to people sitting on the bench who weren't coming into work um, during a period of time. That's somewhat common early in the pandemic, but not necessarily for too long. Um, and what I have seen is some of the ERC mills take the position that all the vacation time of these employees in 2020 and or 2021 um, counts as time for not work. The IRS guidance clearly says that is not the case. 
And so if you have working with a provider that's including all your sick time and vacation in there, um, get a second opinion on that. So again, for large employers, you can only get the credit on wages paid to people not providing services. Okay, so now we'll talk about 2021. The rules changed again, taxpayer favorable. The definition of a small employer changed to one having 500 or fewer full-time employees in 2019. Um, so that became, really opened it up to a lot of companies. Uh, a lot of companies have 500 or fewer employees. As a result, a lot more companies became eligible for the maximum employee retention credit benefits. Um, so with that said, uh, again, as a small employer, 500 or fewer as measured in 2019, you, uh, you can include the wages you pay to everybody in all of quarter one, start the clock again in quarter two, start the clock again in quarter three, to the extent you qualify in each of those uh, quarters under either the government order test or the gross receipts test. Um, health plan expenses that are borne by the company also uh, go into this. I find that very few companies paid people not to work in 2021. Um, they had either adapted to the new COVID reality or had let people go. The only other area where you would find wages paid not provide services would be for furloughed employees um, who are let go, but some of the health plan expenses are still covered by the company. That is, those health plan expenses would then be included as a qualified wage. So again, we are focused on companies, 500 or fewer full-timers in 2019. And I think the next slide talks about what that means. When we talk about what a full-time employee is, let's think about it simply. Look for those that worked in every month of 2019. Look for those that worked 130 hours or more in the month and count them as a one. Anybody else uh, who worked 129 hours or fewer, count them as a, basically a zero. And you add up the number of ones in each month of uh, the year 2019, add them up together, divide by 12, that's your average. If it's 100 or 500 or fewer, respectively, for the 20 and 2021 credits, you can then uh, treat yourself as a, as a small employer. So what we do with companies is go back and get a summary of the wages, sorry, the hours worked paid by, uh, sorry, the hours worked by individuals in, uh, in that year to get an accurate count. And this will be something the IRS asks for every time to the extent they have a question. I don't know how many IRS exams there will be around ERC. There haven't been that many yet, but more are coming. I know that, and they have a lot of time to do them. So um, make sure you have this data on hand. This is part of every study that we do. And some aren't even close to the, to the threshold, but it's something you're going to want to have to, um, you're going to want to have to have documented. Okay. So this is another concept as well. When you are, this is known as, as a controlled group analysis, the employee retention credit, let's say, for example, one individual owns 100% of two companies that are separate and distinct with two separate EINs. Uh, the company, sorry, the owner has to aggregate those companies together uh, for purposes of the employee counts in the US and the gross receipts. Um, and so, you know, we're going to look at corporate entities. Basically, you're looking for any common ownership of more than of more than 50% by five or fewer individuals, ultimately at the top. Um, partners, irrespective of whether it's a partnership, corporation, brother, sister entities can come in as well. We can look at affiliated service group rules to the extent the management and control over different groups is essentially common. Um, I would say the easiest thing to think about though in the nonprofit context, 99% of the time, it just uh, you just look at the separate EIN of of the, the not-for-profit. But again, we're always asking, does the owner of the business or owners of the business, are they related to each other? And do they own any other businesses that we would have to then bring in as we look at the employer retention credit? So that's the control group stuff you've probably been hearing about. One important uh, facet of this is that in the context of private equity ownership, um, generally, the fund itself at the top is not an active trader business and therefore 
breaks aggregation among the different portfolio companies. Um, so in the, there was some confusion about that early on, but in the um, private equity context, we have found, uh, yeah, we, we can look at each, generally, each uh, individual portfolio company on its own, potentially its subsidiaries as well. They would have to look be looked at with the, the top the top port co. Um, but again, you don't generally have to include all the gross receipts and all the employee accounts of all the portfolio companies owned in the private equity context. And that's really intended to look to have these businesses independently be able to evaluate whether they qualify. Okay, polling question three. Did your business apply for and receive a PPP loan? Um, pretty simple, yes or no. I would assume 90% of this is gonna be yes on here because PPP was quite popular. The most important thing to keep in mind here is that when a company receives PPP funding, um, the amount of funding it receives that funds wages uh, are those wages are not eligible for ERC. But what we've seen as well is that the time period of a PPP uh, covered period is generally pretty long, 24 weeks. And um, there tends to be, for ERC purposes, enough wages over that 24 week period to allocate the PPP funding to wages that wouldn't hit the ERC anyway. Interesting, no, more businesses on this did not apply for and get a PPP loan, 63%. I am uh, somewhat amazed at that. That's interesting because it has been my experience as I've been talking to clients, but um, good to know. All right. So everybody on here, uh, you wouldn't, 63% of you wouldn't have to worry about your PPP funding. All right. Here we go. Okay. So some other general considerations, things we've learned over time, IRS guidance that's come out. If you got uh, your PPP forgiveness, <clears throat> either under the PPP program, Restaurant Revitalization Fund, Shuttered Venue Grant Program, those funds are not treated as gross receipts for the gross receipts test. We thought they might have been at first, but then it was in August 21 that the IRS clarified that it did not. Um, I talked about this earlier, this income tax offset. Basically, you have to reduce your wages in 20 and 21 by the amount of ERC that you got for those years. Um, in terms of time period, as I mentioned that you have, to, you have to do a paper filing for the employer retention credit. And uh, the refund claims are generally taking, eh, I would say this should be updated a little bit, between four and 12 months, as opposed to between six. It seems to have gotten a little bit faster. The IRS, it, honestly, I have to credit the IRS for doing a wonderful job. Uh, I know it's frustrating to deal with them sometimes, but this was an unprecedented number of paper filings that they got. Uh, and then you have all these ERC emails perpetuating, I would say, misinformation, so they get more claims. Um, the IRS has not done too bad of a job, actually, uh, when it comes to getting these done. But again, because they're paper filings, and due to their underfunding for years, there was no ability to make an electronic filing, um, it takes a while. So I would say it takes between four, four and 12 months after the time you file. Um, to the extent you were with a PEO, it will be you attesting to the PTO, PEO that you qualify. And uh, the PEO then does a filing for you. In that context, I cannot reach out to the IRS on your behalf, um, nor can any of my team. It's really based on the relationship with you and your PEO. Next, the R&D tax credit. Specifically in 2021, the uh, wages included in the ERC calculation cannot also be included as a qualified research expense. To the extent you qualify for both, and there's uh, overlap in terms of which wage and which credit you should go for, put it into the ERC uh, because that's a much higher statutory rate. Um, but also keep in mind that even if you moved it to ERC, you still need to track that expense as a qualified research expense for future years if you're calculating your base amount. If you know anything about the R&D tax credit, you look at what your current year qualified research expenses are, then look back three years uh, to what your QREs are. And if in one of those three years, some of those QREs were moved and included um, as an ERC, they still count as a QRE when you're doing your base amount. And again, the statute of limitations for 2020 claims is April of 24. And for 2021 claims, it's April 
yeah, specifically April 15th of 2025. So um, there's time, but again, it is running out somewhat as well. So uh, if you're gonna focus on a government order test from 2020, look at it quickly. And also if you work with a PEO, see if they're even still filing 2020 claims at this point. All right, IRS exams. We'll just talk about what's both included in our deliverables when we do this. I think many of the reputable provider deliverables when they do the, an ERC claim, but what you have to have is your original form 941 included. Um, basically, the, the, then the summary of person by person, who was included in your uh, employee retention credit calculation, differentiating between wages and healthcare costs. Um, you want to get the list of employees who were paid sick and or family leave. There's another credit known as the Families First Coronavirus Relief, Relief, Relief Act um, that required, well, that provided a benefit to companies, uh, to people, to companies that paid for people to take care of uh, a loved one, or basically a family member or, um, or themselves while they may have had COVID in 20 and 21. Um, you want, again, you want to break out the, uh, the amounts paid for wages and for healthcare costs um, you're going to want to, in your documentation, clearly identify why you are an eligible employer. Specifically, show the gross receipts declines, have those book and records ready to the extent they need to be examined by the service, but clearly show that you had a more than 50% or more than 20% decline. Also, if you have uh, are claiming a disruption due to government orders, have the government orders listed, but that's not enough tell the story in your documentation about how those government orders really created a disruption or a partial suspension of your business. That's the fact portion that goes along with the law portion. And it's making those two, making the facts, uh, basically show how it touches the business and telling that story exactly about how you as an organization were disrupted or a more than nominal piece of your business was disrupted. But you're gonna to need to have your forms W-2. Um, and again, documentation show why you are an eligible employer. Okay, again, this is just continued, um, but also what I've seen is them asking for the copies of the 1120s or the 1065s um, for the years in question to see if you took that deduction, reduction of deduction, shall we say, for the amount you received from employee retention credits. Um, you want to show if there are any family members on payroll of those who control the company, because typically speaking, the, the, the family of the controlling owners are not included as employees in the, uh, in the employee retention credit. What I like to say is the IRS figured that you would, if you were really to ever fire your uh, employees, the ones that you would fire last or let go of last would be your family members. And so there's no credit to just hang on to family members. Um, and again, ah, most importantly, show that you didn't double count and that you, the PPP received for the 36% of the people on the call who, who got PPP funding, that the PPP funded wages were not included in your um, employer retention credit wages. <clears throat> but don't think that that necessarily is going to diminish your credit. It may a little, but generally speaking, there's enough leftover wages for ERC purposes so that you can fully claim both PPP and ERC, but you need to clearly define and show and allocate wages funded by PPP and that uh, funded by uh, that, those wages that went into ERC that were unfunded. All right, so last question. Has your company applied for the employer retention credit? No, but interested in a follow-up conversation? If you are, um, please hit that and somebody from you know my team is happy to reach out to you and talk to you. Yes, but now we need help with an IRS audit. Same deal. Um, we can basically look at what was done, what was documented and help you address questions being asked by the IRS. Uh, no, my organization doesn't qualify. Um, you're just here for CPE credit or you're here to understand why you're seeing all these, uh, all these um, uh, TV ads and, and radio ads or yes, we have already received our ERC credits. We'll see how this comes out. I would bet, I don't know, let's see. Uh, let's see how it's gonna work out here. Okay, so no, but interested in follow-up, 8%, that's great. 
Yes, you need help with an IRS audit. That's two more percent. We can absolutely do that. Um, and no, you don't qualify. Um, sounds like you have a good provider, but if you wanted to understand or take another look at it, more than happy to look at it and talk to you. And yes, we've already received our ERC credits. I'm kind of not surprised by this. So um, this is probably, this makes a lot of sense in terms of what I think the answer should be. So good stuff. Everybody, thanks so much for joining today. Again, my name is Marty Karaman, uh, I'm partner in charge of tax credits and sentence advisory at Cherry Beckert. Um, thank you for attending. I hope it was valuable to you. Uh, normally on these things, I have one of my colleagues on, but they weren't available today. We make it a little bit more conversational, hopefully more fun that way, but I hope nobody was too bored with uh, me just going through the rules. And if you had questions and you put them in, uh, we will get back to you immediately. So with that said, thank you so much for joining. Um, and you got Marty? some CDs today. Yeah. Hey, thanks for an awesome presentation. We just had two questions pop up. I thought if we Great. had a little extra time, I could read those. Is that okay? Yeah, Okay. So we had one question from Archie, and that is, how is the full or partial suspension test applied for businesses that started really late in 2019, like November or December? Can the 10% more than nominal measurement be similarly applied using 2020 figures? It's a very good question. Um, the short answer around, around, it's interesting, when it comes to companies that were purchased in 2020 and you're doing your employee counts, you can rely on um, 2020 gross receipts. In this particular context, uh, I would focus less on what took place in 2019 because that's really a safe harbor. It's not necessarily required to qualify. You just need to develop your facts about what your business I mean, I don't know, start to look at January and February of 2020 and what the intention of the business was. And then um, you'll have to tell that story and document it appropriately with the service. The 2019 comparison is, is merely a safe harbor. You can develop a position based specifically on 2020. And in some cases, like, I don't know, if you're a restaurant or something like that, it becomes quite easy to identify and understand how government orders affected you. Also. If you started in like after mid February 2020, there's another credit called the Recovery Startup Credit that um, doesn't require you to look at the gross receipts from 2019, et cetera. And it actually provides a credit for quarters three and four of 2021. It's the only fourth quarter 2021 credit available, up to 50,000 each. Um, and so for these businesses that started, you know, in February or later of 2020, uh, Take a look at um, yeah. Take a take a look at like uh, whether or not you had gross receipts of more than a million dollars, and you may have an automatic qualification there. Last point I'll just say is if you're looking at your gross receipts test and you started late in 2020, you didn't start to have revenue, et cetera. That technically you have to look at like even like a dollar of interest income in there when you're look when you're doing your comparison to 2020 and 2021. But the question at hand, the 2019 thing is a safe harbor. It is not necessarily required to show that you had an effect on a more than nominal portion of the business. And I'm sure under the right analysis and facts and circumstances, you could document that appropriately. What's the other Thanks, question? Marty. And the final question is, what if a large employer established a new sick bank for employees to use outside of the existing vacation slash sick days? Would the sick bank specifically for COVID count as qualified wages? I think it would, um, because you're in that case as a large employer, especially if you're more than 500 in 2021, um, you wouldn't qualify for the FFCRA, but payment of time for people not providing services and being out due to COVID, I think qualifies as legitimate time um, paid for not providing services as a large employer. So I think, I think the answer to that question is yes. Uh, we've been thinking about that a lot lately. So thank you. Is that all we got? That's all. Thanks, Marty. And thanks for all being right, with guys. us today, everyone.